Section 6 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen L. Moss. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 6. Surveyor and Representative The discharged volunteer arrived in New Salem only ten days before the August election, in which he had a deep personal interest. Before starting for the wars he had announced himself, according to the custom of the time, by a handbill circular, as a candidate for the legislature from Sangamon County. Footnote we are aware that all former biographers have stated that Lincoln's candidacy for the legislature was subsequent to his return from the war, and a consequence of his service. But his circular is dated March ninth, 1832, and the Sangamo Journal mentions his name among the candidates in July, and apologizes for having accidentally omitted it in May. End footnote. He had done this in accordance with his own natural bent for public life and desire for usefulness and distinction, and not without strong encouragement from friends whose opinion he valued. He had even then considerable experience in speaking and thinking on his feet. He had begun his practice in that direction before leaving Indiana, and continued it everywhere he had gone. Mr. William Butler tells us that on one occasion, when Lincoln was a farmhand at Island Grove, the famous circuit rider, Peter Cartwright, came by, electioneering for the legislature, and Lincoln at once engaged in a discussion with him in the cornfield, in which the great Methodist was equally astonished at the close reasoning and the uncouth figure of Mr. Brown's extraordinary hired man. At another time, after one Posey, a politician in search of office, had made a speech in Macon, John Hanks, whose admiration of his cousin's oratory was unbounded, said that Abe could beat it. He turned a keg on end, and the tall boy mounted it and made his speech. The subject was the navigation of the Sangamon, and Abe beat him to death, says the loyal Hanks. So it was not without the tremor of a complete novice that the young man took the stump during the few days left him between his return and the election. He ran as a Whig. As this has been denied on authority which is generally trustworthy, it is well enough to insist upon the fact. We have a memorandum in Mr. Lincoln's own handwriting in which he says he ran as an avowed clay man. In one of the few speeches of his, which made at this time have been remembered and reported, he said, I am in favor of a national bank. I am in favor of the internal improvement system and of a high protective tariff. These are my sentiments and political principles. Nothing could be more unqualified or outspoken than this announcement of his adhesion to what was then and for years afterwards called the American system of Henry Clay. Other testimony is not wanting to the same effect. Both Major Stewart and Judge Logan, footnote, the Democrats of New Salem worked for Lincoln out of their personal regard for him. That was the general understanding of the matter here at the time. In this he made no concession of principle whatever. He was as stiff as a man could be in his Whig doctrines. They did this for him simply because he was popular, because he was Lincoln. Stephen T. Logan, July 6th, 1875, and footnote, say that Lincoln ran in 1832 as a Whig, and that his speeches were unevasively in defense of the principles of that party. Without discussing the merits of the party or its purposes, we may insist that his adopting them thus openly at the outset of his career was an extremely characteristic act and marks thus early the scrupulous conscientiousness which shaped every action of his life. The state of Illinois was by a large majority democratic, hopelessly attached to the person and policy of Jackson. Nowhere had that despotic leader more violent and unscrupulous partisans than there. They were proud of their very servility, and preferred the name of 
whole hog Jackson men to that of Democrats. The Whigs embraced in their scanty ranks the leading men of the state, those who have since been most distinguished in its history, such as S. T. Logan, Stuart, Browning, Dubois, Hardin, Brees, and many others. But they were utterly unable to do anything except by dividing the Jackson men, whose very numbers made their party unwieldy, and by throwing their votes with the more decent and conservative portion of them. In this way, in the late election, they had secured the success of Governor Reynolds, the old ranger, against Governor Kinney, who represented the vehement and proscriptive spirit which Jackson had just breathed into the party. He had visited the general in Washington, and had come back giving out threatenings and slaughter against the Whigs in the true Tennessee style, declaring that all Whigs should be whipped out of office like dogs out of a meat-house. The force of southwestern simile could no further go. But the great popularity of Reynolds and the adroit management of the Whigs carried him through successfully. A single fact will show on which side the people who could read were enlisted. The whole hog party had one newspaper, the opposition five. Of course it would have been impossible for Reynolds to poll a respectable vote if his loyalty to Jackson had been seriously doubted. As it was, he lost many votes through a report that he had been guilty of saying that he was as strong for Jackson as any reasonable man should be. The governor himself, in his naive account of the canvas, acknowledges the damaging nature of this accusation, and comforts himself with quoting an indiscretion of Kinney's, who opposed a projected canal on the ground that it would flood the country with Yankees. It showed some moral courage, and certainly an absence of the shuffling politician's fair-weather policy, that Lincoln, in his obscure and penniless youth, at the very beginning of his career, when he was not embarrassed by antecedents or family connections, and when, in fact, what little social influence he knew would have led him the other way, chose to oppose a furiously intolerant majority, and to take his stand with the party which was doomed to long-continued defeat in Illinois. The motives which led him to take this decisive course are not difficult to imagine. The better sort of people in Sangamon County were Whigs, though the majority were Democrats, and he preferred, through life, the better sort to the majority. The papers he read were the Louisville Journal and the Sangamo Journal, both Whig. Reading the speeches and debates of the day, he sided with Webster against Calhoun, and with Clay against anybody. Though his notions of politics, like those of any ill-educated young man of twenty-two, must have been rather crude, and not at all sufficient to live and to die by, he had adopted them honestly and sincerely, with no selfish regard to his own interests, and though he ardently desired success, he never abated one jot or tittle of his convictions for any possible personal gain, then or thereafter. In the circular in which he announced his candidacy he made no reference to national politics, but confined himself mainly to a discussion of the practicability of improving the navigation of the Sangamon, the favorite hobby of the place and time. He had no monopoly of this issue. It formed the burden of nearly every candidate's appeal to the people in that year. The excitement occasioned by the trip of the talisman had not yet died away, although the little steamer was now dust and ashes, and her bold commander had left the state to avoid an awkward meeting with the sheriff. The hope of seeing Springfield an emporium of commerce was still lively among the citizens of Sangamon County, and in no one of the handbills of the political aspirants of the season was that hope more judiciously encouraged than in the one signed by Abraham Lincoln. It was a well-written circular, remarkable for its soberness and reserve when we consider the age and the limited advantages of the writer. It concluded in these words, Upon the subjects of which I have treated, I have spoken as I have thought. I may be wrong in regard to any or all of them, but holding it a sound maxim that it is better only sometimes to be right than at all times wrong, so soon as I discover my opinions to be erroneous I shall be ready to renounce them. 
every man is said to have his peculiar ambition. Whether it be true or not, I can say for one that I have no other so great as that of being truly esteemed by my fellow men by rendering myself worthy of their esteem. How far I shall succeed in gratifying this ambition is yet to be developed. I am young and unknown to many of you. I was born and have ever remained in the most humble walks of life. I have no wealthy or powerful relations or friends to recommend me. My case is thrown exclusively upon the independent voters of the county, and if elected, they will have conferred a favor upon me for which I shall be unremitting in my labors to compensate. But if the good people in their wisdom shall see fit to keep me in the background, I have been too familiar with disappointments to be very much chagrined. This is almost precisely the style of his later years. The errors of grammar and construction which spring invariably from an effort to avoid redundancy of expression remained with him through life. He seemed to grudge the space required for necessary parts of speech. But his language was at twenty-two, as it was thirty years later, the simple and manly attire of his thought, with little attempt at ornament and none at disguise. There was an intermediate time when he sinned in the direction of fine writing, but this ebullition soon passed away, and left that marvelously strong and transparent style in which his two inaugurals were written. Of course, in the ten days left him after his return from the field, a canvas of the county, which was then, before its division, several thousand square miles in extent, was out of the question. He made a few speeches in the neighborhood of New Salem, and at least one in Springfield. He was wholly unknown there except by his few comrades in arms. We find him mentioned in the county paper only once during the summer, in an editorial note adding the name of Captain Lincoln to those candidates for the legislature who were periling their lives on the frontier and had left their reputations in charge of their generous fellow citizens at home. On the occasion of his speaking at Springfield, most of the candidates had come together to address a meeting there to give their electors some idea of their quality. These were severe ordeals for the rash aspirants for popular favor. Besides those citizens who came to listen and judge, there were many whose only object was the free whiskey provided for the occasion, and who, after potations pottle deep, became not only highly unparliamentary, but even dangerous to life and limb. This wild chivalry of Lick Creek was, however, less redoubtable to Lincoln than it might be to an urban statesman unacquainted with the frolic brutality of Clary's Grove. Their gambols never caused him to lose his self-possession. It is related that once, while he was speaking, he saw a ruffian attack a friend of his in the crowd, and the rencontre not resulting according to the orator's sympathies, he descended from the stand seized the objectionable fighting man by the neck, threw him some ten feet, then calmly mounted to his place and finished his speech, the course of his logic undisturbed by this athletic parenthesis. Judge Logan saw Lincoln for the first time on the day when he came up to Springfield on his canvas this summer. He thus speaks of his future partner. He was a very tall, gawky, and rough-looking fellow then. His pantaloons didn't meet his shoes by six inches. But after he began speaking, I became very much interested in him. He made a very sensible speech. His manner was very much the same as in after life. That is, the same peculiar characteristics were apparent then, though of course in after years he evinced more knowledge and experience. But he had then the same novelty and the same peculiarity in presenting his ideas. He had the same individuality that he kept through all his life. There were two or three men at the meeting whose good opinion was worth more than all the votes of Lick Creek to one beginning life. Stephen T. Logan, a young lawyer who had recently come from Kentucky with the best equipment for a Nisi Prius practitioner ever brought into the state. Major Stewart, whom we have met in the Black Hawk War, once commanding a battalion and then marching as a private, and William Butler, afterwards prominent in state politics, at that time a young man of the purest western breed in body and character, clear-headed and courageous, 
and ready for any emergency where a friend was to be defended or an enemy punished. We do not know whether Lincoln gained any votes that day, but he gained what was far more valuable, the active friendship of these able and honorable men, all Whigs and all Kentuckians like himself. The acquaintances he made in his canvass, the practice he gained in speaking, and the added confidence which this experience of measuring his abilities with those of others gave, were all the advantages which Lincoln derived from this attempt. He was defeated, for the only time in his life, in a contest before the people. The fortunate candidates were E. D. Taylor, J. T. Stewart, Achilles Morris, and Peter Cartwright, the first of whom received 1,127 votes, and the last 815. Lincoln's position among the eight defeated candidates was a very respectable one. He had 657 votes, and there were five who fared worse, among them his old adversary Kirkpatrick. What must have been especially gratifying to him was the fact that he received the almost unanimous vote of his own neighborhood, the precinct of New Salem, 277 votes against three, a result which showed more strongly than any words could do the extent of the attachment and the confidence which his genial and upright character had inspired among those who knew him best. Having been, even in so slight a degree, a soldier and a politician, he was unfitted for a day laborer, but being entirely without means of subsistence, he was forced to look about for some suitable occupation. We know he thought seriously at this time of learning the trade of a blacksmith, and using in that honest way the sinew and brawn which nature had given him. But an opening for another kind of business occurred, which prevented his entering upon any merely mechanical occupation. Two of his most intimate friends were the brothers Herndon, called, according to the fashion of the time, which held it unfriendly to give a man his proper name, and arrogant for him to claim it, Roe and Jim. They kept one of those grocery stores in which everything saleable on the frontier was sold, and which seemed to have changed their occupants as rapidly as sentry boxes. Jim sold his share to an idle and dissolute man named Barry, and Roe soon transferred his interest to Lincoln. It was easy enough to buy, as nothing was ever given in payment but a promissory note. A short time afterwards, one Reuben Radford, who kept another shop of the same kind, happened one evening to attract the dangerous attention of the Clary's Grove boys, who, with their usual prompt and practical facetiousness, without a touch of malice in it, broke his windows and wrecked his store. The next morning, while Radford was ruefully contemplating the ruin, and doubtless concluding that he had had enough of a country where the local idea of neighborly humor found such eccentric expression, he hailed a passerby named Green, and challenged him to buy his establishment for four hundred dollars. This sort of trade was always irresistible to these western speculators, and Green at once gave his note for the amount. It next occurred to him to try to find out what the property was worth, and doubting his own skill, he engaged Lincoln to make an invoice of it. The young merchant, whose appetite for speculation had just been whetted by his own investment, undertook the task, and finding the stock of goods rather tempting, offered Green two hundred fifty dollars for his bargain, which was at once accepted. Not a cent of money changed hands in all these transactions. By virtue of half a dozen signatures, Barry and Lincoln became proprietors of the only mercantile establishment in the village, and the apparent wealth of the community was increased by a liberal distribution of their notes among the Herndons, Radford, Green, and a Mr. Rutledge, whose business they had also bought. Fortunately for Lincoln and for the world, the enterprise was not successful. It was entered into without sufficient reflection and from the very nature of things was destined to fail. To Barry, the business was merely the refuge of idleness. He spent his time in gossip, and drank up his share of the profits, and it is probable that Lincoln was far more interested in politics and general reading than in the petty traffic of his shop. In the spring of the next year, finding that their merchandise was gaining them little or nothing, 
they concluded to keep a tavern in addition to their other business, and the records of the county court of Sangamon County show that Barry took out a license for that purpose on the 6th of March, 1833. Footnote. The following is an extract from the court record. March 6th, 1833. Ordered that William F. Barry, in the name of Barry and Lincoln, have license to keep a tavern in New Salem, to continue twelve months from this date, and that they pay one dollar in addition to six dollars heretofore prepaid as per treasurer's receipt, and that they be allowed the following rates, viz. French brandy, per pint, twenty-five, peach, one eighty-three slash four, apple, twelve, Holland gin, one eighty-three slash four, domestic, one twenty-one slash two, Wine, 25. Rum, 183-4. Whiskey, 121-2. Breakfast, dinner, or supper, 25. Lodging for night, 121-2. Horse for night, 25. Single feed, 121-2. Breakfast, dinner, or supper for stage passengers, 371-2. Who gave bond as required by law? End footnote. But it was even then too late for any expedients to save the moribund partnership. The tavern was never opened, for about this time Lincoln and Barry were challenged to sell out to a pair of vagrant brothers named Trent, who, as they had no idea of paying, were willing to give their notes to any amount. They soon ran away, and Barry expired, extinguished in rum. Lincoln was thus left loaded with debts, and with no assets except worthless notes of Barry and the Trents. It is greatly to his credit that he never thought of doing by others as others had done by him. The morality of the frontier was deplorably loose in such matters, and most of these people would have concluded that the failure of the business expunged its liabilities. But Lincoln made no effort even to compromise the claims against him. He promised to pay when he could, and it took the labor of years to do it but he paid at last every farthing of the debt, which seemed to him and his friends so large that it was called among them the national debt. He had already begun to read elementary books of law, borrowed from Major Stewart and other kindly acquaintances. Indeed, it is quite possible that Barry and Lincoln might have succeeded better in business if the junior member of the firm had not spent so much of his time reading Blackstone and Chitty in the shade of a great oak just outside the door, while the senior quietly fuddled himself within. Eyewitnesses still speak of the grotesque youth, habited in homespun tow, lying on his back with his feet on the trunk of the tree, and poring over his book by the hour, grinding around with the shade as it shifted from north to east. After his store, to use his own expression, had winked out, he applied himself with more continuous energy to his reading, doing merely what odd jobs came to his hand to pay his current expenses, which were of course very slight. He sometimes helped his friend Ellis in his store, sometimes went into the field and renewed his exploits as a farmhand, which had gained him a traditional fame in Indiana sometimes employed his clerky hand in straightening up a neglected ledger. It is probable that he worked for his board oftener than for any other compensation, and his hearty friendliness and vivacity, as well as his industry in the field, made him a welcome guest in any farmhouse in the county. His strong arm was always at the disposal of the poor and needy, it is said of him, with a graphic variation of a well-known text, that he visited the fatherless and the widow, and chop their wood. In the spring of this year, 1833, he was appointed postmaster of New Salem, and held the office for three years. Its emoluments were slender, and its duties light, but there was in all probability no citizen of the village who could have made so much of it as he. The mails were so scanty that he was said to carry them in his hat, and he is also reported to have read every newspaper that arrived. It is altogether likely that this formed the leading inducement of his taking the office. His incumbency lasted until New Salem ceased to be populous enough for a post station, and the mail went by to Petersburg. 
Dr. J. G. Holland relates a sequel to this official experience, which illustrates the quaint honesty of the man. Several years later, when he was a practicing lawyer, an agent of the post office department called upon him and asked for a balance due from the New Salem office, some seventeen dollars. Lincoln rose, and opening a little trunk which lay in a corner of the room, took it from a cotton rag in which was tied up the exact sum required. I never use any man's money but my own, he quietly remarked. When we consider the pinching poverty in which these years had been passed, we may appreciate the self-denial which had kept him from making even a temporary use of this little sum of government money. John Calhoun, the surveyor of Sangamon County, was at this time overburdened with work. The principal local industry was speculation in land. Every settler, of course, wanted his farm surveyed and marked out for him, and every community had its syndicate of leading citizens who cherished a scheme of laying out a city somewhere. In many cases the city was plotted, the sites of the principal buildings, including a courthouse and a university, were determined, and a sonorous name was selected out of Plutarch before its location was even considered. For this latter office the intervention of an official surveyor was necessary, and therefore Mr. Calhoun had more business than he could attend to without assistance. Looking about for a young man of good character, intelligent enough to learn surveying at short notice, his attention was soon attracted to Lincoln. He offered young Abraham a book containing the elements of the art, and told him when he had mastered it he should have employment. The offer was a flattering one and Lincoln, with that steady self-reliance of his, accepted it, and armed with his book went out to the schoolmasters, Menton Grahams, and in six weeks close application made himself a surveyor. Footnote. There has been some discussion as to whether Lincoln served as deputy under Calhoun or Neal. The truth is that he served under both of them. Calhoun was surveyor in 1833, when Lincoln first learned the business. Neal was elected in 1835, and immediately appointed Lincoln and Calhoun as his deputies. The Sangamo Journal of September 12, 1835, contains the following official advertisement. Surveyor's Notice I have appointed John B. Watson, Abram Lincoln, and John Calhoun, deputy surveyors for Sangamon County. In my absence from town, any persons wishing their land surveyed will do well to call at the recorder's office and enter his or their names in a book left for that purpose, stating township and range in which they respectively live, and their business shall be promptly attended to. T. M. Neal An article by Colonel G. A. Pierce, printed April 21, 1881, in the Chicago Inter-Ocean, describes an interview held in that month with W. G. Green of Menard County, in which this matter is referred to. But Mr. Green relies more on the document in his possession than on his recollection of what took place in 1833. "'Where did Lincoln learn his surveying?' I asked. "'Took it up himself,' replied Mr. Green, as he did a hundred things, and mastered it too. When he acted as surveyor, here he was deputy of T. M. Neal, and not of Calhoun, as has often been said. There was a dispute about this, and many sketches of his life gave Calhoun, Candlebox Calhoun as he was afterwards known during the Kansas Troubles and election frauds, as the surveyor, but it was Neal. Mr. Green turned to his desk and threw out an old certificate in the handwriting of Lincoln, giving the boundaries of certain lands, and signed T. M. Neal, surveyor, by A. Lincoln, deputy, thus settling the question. Mr. Green was a Democrat and has leaned towards that party all his life, but what he thought and thinks of Lincoln can be seen by an endorsement on the back of the certificate named, which is as follows. Preserve this, as it is the noblest of God's creation, A. Lincoln, the second preserver of his country, May 3, 1865, penned by W. G. Green, who taught Lincoln the English grammar in 1831. End footnote. It will be remembered that Washington in his youth adopted the same profession. But there were few points of similarity in the lives of the two great presidents in youth or later manhood. 
The Virginian had every social advantage in his favor, and was by nature a man of more thrift and greater sagacity in money matters. He used the knowledge gained in the practice of his profession so wisely that he became rather early in life a large landholder, and continually increased his possessions until his death. Lincoln, with almost unbounded opportunities for the selection and purchase of valuable tracts, made no use whatever of them. He employed his skill and knowledge merely as a breadwinner, and made so little provision for the future that when Mr. Van Bergen, who had purchased the Radford note, sued and got judgment on it, his horse and his surveying instruments were taken to pay the debt, and only by the generous intervention of a friend was he able to redeem these invaluable means of his living. He was, nevertheless, an excellent surveyor. His portion of the public work executed under the directions of Mr. Calhoun and his successor, T. M. Neal, was well performed, and he soon found his time pretty well employed with private business which came to him from Sangamon and the adjoining counties. Early in the year 1834 we find him appointed one of three viewers to locate a road from Salt Creek to the county line in the direction of Jacksonville. The board seems to have consisted mainly of its chairman, as Lincoln made the deposit of money required by law, surveyed the route, plotted the road, and wrote the report. Footnote. As this is probably the earliest public document extant written and signed by Lincoln, we give it in full. March 3, 1834. Reuben Harrison presented the following petition. We, the undersigned, respectfully request your honorable body to appoint viewers to view and locate a road from Music's Ferry on Salt Creek, via New Salem, to the county line in the direction of Jacksonville. And Abram Lincoln deposited with the clerk ten dollars, as the law directs, ordered that Michael Killen, Hugh Armstrong, and Abram Lincoln be appointed to view said road, and said Lincoln to act as surveyor. To the County Commissioner's Court for the County of Sangamon at its June term, 1834. We, the undersigned, being appointed to view and locate a whole length of road, 26 road, beginning at Music's Ferry on Salt Creek, via New Salem, to the county line in the direction of Jacksonville, respectfully report that we have performed the duties of said view and location, as required by law, and that we have made the location on good ground, and believe the establishment of the same to be necessary and proper. The enclosed map gives the courses and distances as required by law. Michael Killen, Hugh Armstrong, A. Lincoln. Endorsement in pencil, also in Lincoln's handwriting. A. Lincoln, five days at three dollars, fifteen dollars. John A. Kelso, chain bearer, for five days at seventy-five cents, three dollars, seventy-five cents. Robert Lloyd at seventy-five cents, three dollars, seventy-five cents. Hugh Armstrong, for services as axeman, five days at seventy-five cents, three dollars and seventy-five cents. A. Lincoln, for making plot and report, two dollars and fifty cents. On map, whole length of road, twenty-six miles and seventy chains, scale, two inches to the mile. End footnote. Though it is evident that the post office and the surveyor's compass were not making a rich man of him, they were sufficient to enable him to live decently, and during the year he greatly increased his acquaintance and his influence in the county. The one followed the other naturally. Every acquaintance he made became his friend, and even before the end of his unsuccessful canvass in 1832 it had become evident to the observant politicians of the district that he was a man whom it would not do to leave out of their calculations. There seemed to be no limit to his popularity, nor to his aptitudes, in the opinion of his admirers. He was continually called on to serve in the most incongruous capacities. Old residents say he was the best judge at a horse race the county afforded. He was occasionally second in a duel of fisticuffs, though he usually contrived to reconcile the adversaries on the turf before any damage was done. He was the arbiter on all controverted points of literature, science, or woodcraft among the disputatious denizens of Clary's Grove, and his decisions were never appealed from. 
His native tact and humor were invaluable in his work as a peacemaker, and his enormous physical strength, which he always used with a magnanimity rare among giants, placed his off-hand decrees beyond the reach of contemptuous question. He composed differences among friends and equals with good-natured raillery, but he was as rough as need be when his wrath was roused by meanness and cruelty. We hardly know whether to credit some of the stories, apparently well attested by living witnesses, of his prodigious muscular powers. He is said to have lifted, at Rutledge's mill, a box of stones weighing over half a ton. It is also related that he could raise a barrel of whiskey from the ground and drink from the bung, but the narrator adds that he never swallowed the whiskey. Whether these traditions are strictly true or not, they are evidently founded on the current reputation he enjoyed among his fellows for extraordinary strength, and this was an important element in his influence. He was known to be capable of handling almost any man he met, yet he never sought a quarrel. He was everybody's friend, and yet used no liquor or tobacco. He was poor, and had scarcely ever been at school, yet he was the best informed young man in the village. He had grown up on the frontier, the utmost fringe of civilization, yet he was gentle and clean of speech, innocent of blasphemy or scandal. His good qualities might have excited resentment if displayed by a well-dressed stranger from an eastern state, but the most uncouth ruffians of New Salem took a sort of proprietary interest and pride in the decency and the cleverness and the learning of their friend and comrade, Abe Lincoln. It was regarded, therefore, almost as a matter of course that Lincoln should be a candidate for the legislature at the next election, which took place in August 1834. He was sure of the united support of the Whigs, and so many of the Democrats also wanted to vote for him that some of the leading members of that party came to him and proposed they should give him an organized support. He was too loyal a partisan to accept their overtures without taking counsel from the Whig candidates. He laid the matter before Major Stewart, who at once advised him to make the canvass. It was a generous and chivalrous action, for by thus encouraging the candidacy of Lincoln, he was endangering his own election. But his success two years before, in the face of a vindictive opposition led by the strongest Jackson men in the district, had made him somewhat confident, and he perhaps thought he was risking little by giving a helping hand to his comrade in the spy battalion. Before the election Lincoln's popularity developed itself in rather a portentous matter, and it required some exertion to save the seat of his generous friend. At the close of the poll, the four successful candidates held the following relative positions. Lincoln, 1,376. Dawson, 1,370. Carpenter, 1,170. And Stewart, at that time probably the most prominent young man in the district, and the one marked out by the public voice for an early election to Congress, 1,164. End of section 6. Recording by Stephen L. Moss. Stephen L. Moss dot com.